What's going on guys? Welcome to NetSec Explain. In the last video, we covered how to build a basic spam filter using machine learning. In this video, we're going to use the same techniques and apply them to a new challenge. What we're going to do in here is use machine learning to build a malicious URL predictor. As we go through this next workbook, I want you to focus on the similarities and differences between what we did for our spam filter and what we'll need to do for the URL predictor. So let's get started. All of the code for these workbooks can be found here on GitHub. If we scroll into the readme, we'll be using workbook two for the malicious URL predictor. Just like last time, we're gonna open this up in playground mode. We can go ahead and scroll all the way down into the initial setup tab. When we run these, Colab will warn us that this is user submitted code, but we can just go ahead and accept that. In this first code block, we're simply downloading the data from GitHub and doing some initial configuration. In the next code block, we're importing our libraries. Starting at the top, we have pandas and numpy for processing CSV files, matplotlib for graphs, and then random NRE, which we'll be using later. After that, we have some scikit-learn helper functions specifically train test split, and of course the TF IDF and count vectorizers. We're also going to reuse and import the logistic regression and multinomial naive Bayesian models. Finally, we have some metric functions. Now we're ready to load up our data. And this is the first difference that we come across. In the spam filter example, each of our emails were separated out into different files. For this one, we're given a single CSV file containing all of our data set. So we're going to go ahead and use pandas to read the CSV, and we're going to define a test URL as just some random URL in the data set. To get an idea of what our data looks like, we're going to print the pandas data frame. Here we can see that the CSV only has two columns, one for the URLs and one for the class labels. Remember, before you do any machine learning tasks, you need to know what your data looks like. Another thing to think about is that our data is not already split up into training and testing. So for that task, we're going to use the scikit-learn train test split function. It's a really simple function that randomly samples a certain percentage of your data and splits it up into training and testing. In this case, I set the testing percentage to be 20% and we'll be using the remaining 80% for training. To do this, we feed the function the full data set and then the testing size that we want. It even has the ability to enter in a random seed. For consistency, I'll be using the seed 42. Let's also get a graph of our data to see how many of each class we have. In this case, we have about 400,000 URLs in total. And looking at our class count, we have significantly more good URLs than we do bad URLs. Normally, I would consider these counts to be unbalanced classes, which would mean that we need to do some sort of downsampling or upsampling. But for this scenario, it's not really going to matter that much, so we can go ahead and move on to the next section. Like last time, we need to define our tokenizer to tell our functions how to pre-process the data. Now, this time, it's going to be a little different. Based on our data being URL paths, what we're going to do is split up the URL whenever there is a forward slash and a hyphen. We're also going to split up the domains, subdomains, and extensions by splitting up wherever there is a dot. This will give us the tokens subdomain.example.com as well as subdomain, example, and com. And the last thing we're going to do is whenever we come across a www or a .com token, we're just going to clear those out since they're way too common to be useful. If you want to compare this to what we did in the spam filter, these would be like our stop words, where they don't add any context to the message. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now that this may not be the most efficient method, but it's effective, and I encourage you to play around with how you pre-process the data to make it even better. Now we're on to our first task, tokenizing the URL. For this task, all we need to do is print the test URL and then print the tokenized version of the test URL. For the code, it's simple enough to print test URL and then we're going to save our tokenized URL since we'll be using it later. Here, we can see the full URL is ussoccer.com news federation services. And below it, we have the tokenized version ussoccer.com news federation services. 
Something that I want to show you is that if we look all the way off to the end of this list, we have US Soccer and the .com has been removed. We also have in.aspx as well as in and aspx separated out. Okay, next we're going to vectorize our data and immediately we hop right into task two where we train the vectorizers. This task is going to be exactly the same as what we did for the spam filter. We're going to create our count vectorizer and TF IDF vectorizer in order to pre-process our training data. So for the code, we create CVEC as our count vectorizer using our tokenizer function as the tokenizer. From there, we create count X by transforming the training data frame on the URLs column of the CSV we imported. And then we go ahead and do the same thing using the TF IDF vectorizer to get our TF IDF X. When we run this, it takes about 30 seconds to complete. Now for task 2a and 2b. These are both optional and exactly the same as what we did for our spam filter, but for the sake of completeness, let's go ahead and run through it anyways. In task 2a, we're going to manually print the count of each token from our test URL. So in the code, we're going to list each token in our tokenized URL that we created earlier, then print the count and the token right after. Looking at the results, the only thing that stands out as interesting is that the word 2 shows up twice. Now, when we do 2b, we'll see why that's important. In 2b, we're going to create an example count and tfidf vectorizers to print the results. So we're going to create count vectorizer with our tokenizer and then perform fit transform on the test URL. Now, don't forget that the function is expecting a list and our test URL is a single string. So we need to surround it with brackets. Then do the same thing for the tfidf vectorizer. When we look at the results from the count vectorizer, we can see that this token 20 has a value of two, meaning that it showed up twice and is probably the word two. And if we look down at the tfidf vectorizer, we can see that everything has a weight of 0.185, except for this token 20, which has a weight of 0.371. Awesome. Now we're ready to test and evaluate our models. For task three, we're going to use our count and TF IDF vectorizers to pre-process our testing data. The code for this is simple. We create test count X by performing transform on the data frame using the URLs column. And then we create test TF IDF X by also performing transform on the test data frame. And this only takes about five seconds to run. We also have our handy dandy report generator function that we're just going to go ahead and run. Okay, we're almost done. Now we're going to create our models for multinomial with TFIDF, multinomial with count, logistic regression with TFIDF, and logistic regression with count. And we're going to do this with all four models again because what may have been best for the spam filter may not be best for this scenario. The good news, however, is that the code is exactly the same. In fact, if we wanted to, we could just copy and paste the same lines from the spam filter and place them into here. This is one of the massive benefits to machine learning and why it's often considered to be artificial intelligence. Instead of us having to write and program functions to perform each of these tasks in an ad hoc way, the machine learning algorithm learns from the data itself. But for the sake of completeness, we're going to go ahead and do all four of these once again. For task 4a, we're going to use multinomial naive Bayesian with our TFIDFX. We're going to create our model constructor, then train our model, test our model, and evaluate how well it did. For the code, we're going to start by creating our multinomial constructor, and we're going to train it with the fit function on TFIDFX and its labels. Then we're going to calculate its accuracy score and collect its predictions on the test data. And finally, we're going to generate the confusion matrix and classification report based on those predictions. When we run it, we see the classification report at the top showing us the recall and precision. Since I kind of hand waved recall and precision in the last video, I want to make sure that I cover it in here. 
Recall and precision are incredibly important when the impact of mislabeling something can have devastating effects. Think of what could happen if we accidentally mislabeled cancer tumors or credit card fraud. People's lives could be damaged. Now, how is this different from accuracy? Well, credit card fraud, as an example, makes up less than a fraction of a percent of all credit card transactions. So we can make a model that's 99.99% accurate by simply saying all transactions are legitimate. Now, that's not very good for detecting credit card fraud, is it? Instead, we want to use recall and precision to determine how well we can identify credit card fraud when it does occur. Think of recall and precision as being a balancing act between how many times you label a particular event correctly versus how many times you incorrectly labeled things as being part of that event. What really helped me understand these two was this little anecdote. Imagine you had a robot and you told it to go to the store and pick you up all the bananas at the store. Now, if the robot went to the store and grabbed all of the bananas, all of the pears, and all of the oranges, then its recall score would be 100% because it picked up or correctly recalled all of the bananas. But its precision in doing that would be very low because it didn't just pick up all the bananas, it picked up all of the pears and all of the oranges as well. Now we have too much fruit. After a few changes, we can ask the robot again to pick up all the bananas from the store. But this time, it only brings back one banana. In this case, its precision would be very high. In fact, 100%. Because all of the fruit that it did pick up were bananas. However, the recall would be very low because it didn't pick up all or even most of the bananas in the store. In an ideal world, we want the precision and recall to be 1, or 100%. This means that the robot grabs all of the bananas and leaves all of the pears and oranges. To recap, recall is how many of the objects in the target class were correctly classified, while precision is of the predictions for the target class, how many were actually correct. So hopefully this helps you understand the difference between recall and precision and how they're used to balance each other out. This is why I like to create a confusion matrix, which we can see underneath, so that we can really follow along with how many things that are bad were classified as bad, and how many things were good were classified as good. In this case, our precision for bad URLs is at 99%, meaning that 99% of the time that we classify something as being a bad URL, we are correct. While at the same time, we only correctly classified 82% of our bad URLs, and this is shown as our recall. Because some of our bad URLs are classified as good, meaning that we have a few false negatives in there, our precision for identifying a good URL is at 96%. That's still not bad. But what's even better is that our recall is 100%, so our model can correctly classify good URLs as being good about 100% of the time. All in all, this gives us an accuracy score of about 96.7%. So let's take a look at the next few models. Okay, so for task 4b, we need to create multinomial with the count vectorizer. Fit the model, score the model, evaluate the model, and boom. All right, we're only doing a little better. We improved accuracy by about 1%, but our recall and precision has changed a bit. Instead, we have a better recall for our bad URLs and a better precision for our good URLs. So we're getting a little closer. For multinomial with count vectorizer, we end up with 97.7% accuracy. Next, we have logistic regression, and for this, we're going to use the LBFGS solver. Okay, this is really interesting. In the spam filter workbook, we saw that each model we built got slightly better and better. But in this case, the two multinomial models are better than this one. It actually lost value with logistic regression. In fact, this is just slightly worse than our multinomial with TFIDF, giving an accuracy score of 96.3. Well, with that, let's go ahead and try our last model, logistic regression with count vectorizer. Here, we have only slightly better scores than our logistic regression with TFIDF, 
with an accuracy score of 97.2%. So between all four of our models, the best one we created was multinomial with count vectorizer, which had an accuracy of 97.7%. But wait, is this the best we got, or can we do better? Remember our machine learning process. If we have a model that doesn't do so well, or we think it could do better, then we can start messing with the hyperparameters. So let's go ahead and try that with the alpha parameter on the two naive Bayesian models. Working from the bottom up, let's set the alpha for the multinomial with count vectorizer model to 0.1, since that worked well for us with the spam filter. Okay, we got a little bit of an improvement from 97.7% accuracy to 97.95% accuracy. Let's try this on the multinomial with TF-IDF. Whoa, that took the model from 96.5% to 98%, going from one of the worst models we had to the best model we have now. What I like about this example is that it's similar enough to the spam filter example, but different enough to really let you play with the machine learning process in new and creative ways. And again, I encourage you to mess with some of these settings in here and really do your own thing to see how things change as you go throughout the pre-processing and the training steps. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. For more information, check out the links in the description below, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. I'll see you next time.